Welcome to today's presentation, which is on conscious collectives and deliberately developmental spaces. I say presentations, also going to be a discussion. It's going to be a pretty informal um, session. So, um, oh, I've already clicked through. Too, oh, too eager. One second. Let me get back. <laughs> oh, soon. Um, so, some of you may have already have come to a couple of the other Life Itself presentations. This is the fourth one out of the four presentations that we were presenting as part of Limicon, which we feel really grateful um, for the space that, that has been provided for us to do that. So I'm not sure if, if I recognize most people from at least one of the other ones. Um, so thank you very much for coming today. Um, I'm Lauren, for those of you that don't know me, I think most of you are familiar with me, but I've been working with Life Itself for about 10 months now, and I'm in the communications and community side of things. Um, you could say like head of, seeing as we're a small team. But uh, yeah, that's kind of me in a nutshell. And I'm be uh, co-hosting today with Matthew. So would you like to introduce yourself, Matthew? Uh, sure. Um, my name is Matthew. Um, I'm currently in the US. Um, and I have a few days off, which is nice because I'm. I feel like nowadays I have a lot of things happening. Um, but yeah, I guess more on the research side um, at Life Itself. So happy to be here at LimCon. Awesome. Rufus may be joining us um, if circumstances allow for him. But if not, we'll just be cracking on. Um, so welcome. That's what we've done. And we wanted to share the intentions. Gosh. <laughs> My mouse is trigger happy today. Share the intentions of the session which is basically to share our research and our resources on the deliberately developmental spaces and conscious collectives. And then also to invite you to pull this through into your own lives if you haven't, or maybe in a different way, and to take a small action to support us in communicating these ideas, these concepts, these actions that we believe are, are really fundamental to creating a paradigm shift and moving through this period of a second renaissance as we term it. So I will skim over this quite quickly because I know most of you are quite familiar with life itself, but we are a collection of pragmatic utopians that are dedicated to wider living and social transformation. And we favor approaches that prioritize inner development and cultural change in a rigorous and practical way. We're an open community and we really feel that the inner development is so key to, to what it is that we're trying to create. But that without the actual practical application isn't particularly useful. So we're really about this, this balance and this alchemizing of the two together. And we believe that that is really what is going to move us in and through this period of the second renaissance. So what we're going to be sharing with you today are, you know, two parts of life itself work, life itself's work that we feel really contributes towards creating this shift. And that is uh, deliberately developmental spaces and conscious collectives. And life itself um, also engages in a variety of different activities from research, community building, hubs, residencies, and now sort of learning resources through some of the courses that we are offering. Okay, so I'll just touch on this before I hand over to to Matthew. Um, or oh, actually, Matthew, you might want to talk about what the deliberately developmental spaces are in the definitions because we left that blank. So, would you like to share the definition? Sure. Um, yeah. Um, I guess I was trying to define it and and stumbling. Um, but I think it's really defined by those three words. Um. And that's generally how we've defined it in the past, where it's a physical space. Um, and even that definition might be contested a little bit, but generally speaking, it's a physical space with some model of development. And there's a particularly um, deliberate focus for, for that development. So there's a strong sense of um, a motivation for inner ontological growth. So that's kind of, those are the three dimensions. Um, it's a physical space usually. Um, it has some developmental model, but it, it's really deliberate in carrying out that developmental model. So they can range from 
places like monasteries. Um, and we're trying to get a diverse sense of the different range of programs, but places like monasteries, um, some, you know, some uh, gap year programs even, but we'll talk about them more later on. Awesome, thank you. And yeah, Conscious Collective, some of you may be more familiar with the term that we've been using, which is conscious co-living, but I'll, I'll touch on that a little bit later in this presentation um, and talk today, it'll be Conscious Collective. And this basically reflects the combination of, of two practices, which kind of does what it says on the tin, which is conscious living, um, or you can think of it as inner growth, inner development, personal development, and co-living or a collective so a collection of individuals that, that have come together into a defined space okay so i'll hand over to you now matthew mm. i'll just keep sharing my screen you can just tell me when you want me to mm. move on to the next slide sure um so i just made this quick diagram um really briefly because i think a lot of people are probably thinking right now what's the difference between conscious collective and a deliberately developmental space. Um, and I think that's a distinction we're kind of in the process of working out. Um, and I think maybe we can even talk about today. But I would generally, for my opinion, I would I would suggest that um, some DDSs are conscious collectives. Um, so for example, you can have a deliberately developmental space which is a conscious collective and vice versa. But each one kind of also has a center of its own and doesn't completely capture the other. So um, deliber deliberately developmental spaces um, are typically more focused on that inner ontological development and conscious collectives are typically more focused on co-living um, and the challenges, opportunities, um, and capacities involved with co-living for the most part. So they're, they're, there's a lot of intersection, but they're not necessarily encapsulated by each other. And each one has a little bit of space um, on their own. And you can go to the next slide, Lauren. Um, so we thought, um, I guess we would kind of lean into the co-creative aspect of it um, and start with the discussion before we talk about um, our research and kind of how we might, or how you guys might get more involved in the project if you would like to. Um, so we wanted to start off with one question. And I think since we're, you know, eight or nine people here, we can just do this um, as, a, as a big group here. Um, so we just wanted to offer this first question. Maybe we can take just a few minutes to discuss it. Um, but the question being, in your own experience, in your opinion, are some spaces more conducive to development of consciousness or inner development? Whatever kind of, I guess, term you would like to put there, but we kind of tend to go with inner ontological development or development of consciousness. Um, and if so, in your experience, what are those spaces like? Um, and said differently, we can we can also just ask, what makes development more accessible in a space? Um, so yeah, we can just open it up there if anyone um, feels inclined to, um, yeah, maybe share an experience. Um, yeah, it looks like Yuli, uh, you raise your hand. Hey, yeah. Um, I'm having something come up from experiences in living in monastic academy are also like some relational um practice locations um <clears throat> what i'm thinking about is one of the challenges i have faced with a with monastic academy is that there's a very strong presence and culture there and i actually found it difficult to stay connected to myself for the reflection process so uh, what i really liked is that there is a real recognition of differences in power and differences in perspective that can actually say, oh, I, I can actually learn something from this, uh, this person I'm, let's say, I'm speaking with or listening to, um, or from these practices. But then the integration component um, gets muddled for me sometimes. So I found that that, that, that was a challenge. And what, what's coming to mind here is kind of 
what is the stepping into other people's perspectives and then making sure to step back out like cycle where it can't always be done at the same time it's like there needs to be different spaces or different capacity for attunement to both um so yeah that's kind of the core thing that comes to mind Yeah, I guess if I could respond really quick, um, unless anyone, anyone else um, would like to really, really quick. Um, for me, I think uh, it is kind of an important balance where you want to have a sense of uh, place and a sense of culture, but not have it be too domineering. Um, so how can it be, how can you strike that balance, I think is is an important um important distinction and i think um yeah we're kind of developing different themes here with with dds kind of like different uh yeah different areas of focus and place is definitely one of those areas so i think it's it's definitely an ongoing conversation for what is how does place and culture connect to a deliberately developmental space so, um, yeah, it's a, it's an interesting question. James? I'll riff a bit on the deliberate piece, or my synonym is intentional, intentional, deliberate, um, and something about the relationship to the, to the space, I'll say abstract space, virtual, physical, uh, whatever kind of space, the relationship to that space and to the learning and to the what goes on in that space. Uh, there's, yeah, there's some sort of like balance and zone. Um, the education field, you might say zone of proximal development, you know, not too hard, not too easy. Uh, or in the game development space, you might say uh, flow. Um, <clears throat> and so there's there's something, there's something about being challenged uh, and the word edge is is useful, like kind of being in the vicinity of a learning edge or an edge implies something about like discomfort uh, or stretching a sense of, you know, not quite being comfortable, but but I think not, you know, crossing over and tipping over into panic, overwhelm, too much. Uh, but there's something about holding a relationship together, holding a stance of, we are going to spend time on the edge together and that we're gonna support each other. And collectively we will be trying to find and stay in that zone, which different people's you know, personal zone of proximal development is in different places, different edges, different uh, growth challenges. Uh, but there's there's something about the uh, the norm agreement level of all the people in a space so like yeah this is going to be a space where yeah it's not about being as cozy comfortable as we can and it's not about being fight club either uh but we're going to play around in that that middle space and it's okay to not be okay you know a little bit and and it's okay to be dis you know, discomforted, um, I think, and within an outer container of like support and, you know, being able to fall back on the outer container of safety and, and support. But um, yeah, seeking to go out to that edge together. Yeah, that's, that's the essence for me. Thanks for sharing. Shall we go back to the um, presentation, Matthew? um sure sure yeah i guess so um unless anyone has any other thoughts i thought that was yeah, really beautiful I, James, I can just briefly sort of ask um like what are the components of a space it's not just a physical space um so mm. what are the modalities of those components as well um mm. sort of what aspect of a space are we looking at mm. can you Does can you elaborate on that does that come up in the presentation, Matthew, or is that something um, 
Not exactly. Um, but I think it's a, it's an interesting question. And I think kind of going back to James's point, this idea of deliberate or intentional, um, where, what is the source of that intentionality or deliberation? Um, and I think a lot of times, uh, and I'm trying to kind of respond to what you said too, Martin. Um, a lot of times there is a sense of deliberateness or a sense of like something has to be done in a specific space, but it comes from, uh, I guess, some kind of hierarchy or like something outside us. So how can that deliberation be um, sprung from each person kind of? How can it be naturally made? How can it be a part of the process and, and not just a hierarchical um, you must do this, you know, you must wake up at 4 a.m. to meditate all these things. How can it be personally um, created, I guess, is is interesting. Um, and I think that kind of, um, I tried to relate it to your part, to your part, but uh, I, I did completely. That is an interesting question. Um, what are the different modalities? And I wouldn't say I have an answer now. Maybe, maybe we can talk about that more, but um, I, yeah, I think to try and make this a bit more concrete like the hub would be a really good example of um, a way that a deliberately developed mental space can be embodied so maybe it's not so much that there are like these super strict um, parameters that it has to have this but there's like the intention there's the practices there's the integration of the personal and the collective and the interweaving of that within within a held structure and that structure can be lighter and maybe a bit more flexible or a bit firmer um, but it, it really involves that focus and that interweaving and that kind of shifting and for the hub as an example they really focus on like everyday practices and how that can also be fed into being a deliberately developmental way of existing and so that kind of facilitates a pulling through into like an actual reality it's not like this sense of everybody will sit chanting for four hours in an afternoon and then maybe when you leave a space that you've been in that chanting isn't necessarily feasible it's like okay I'm showing up to cook dinner how how what impact does this actually have within the space and that's something that I can pull through into my life and that doesn't mean that you know for example if there was four hour workshop on chanting that that isn't something that um is useful it's just you know really the translation as well from what it is the learning is into an actual um, reality that it is kind of really fundamental to to these spaces. Yeah, and I guess, yeah, we can go back to the presentation. Um, and I guess I'll just add really quick, Martin, one modality uh, that I, I think is important to investigate more would be time. So how long does the program last for? How long does it take? to develop certain capacities. Um, and I think uh, sometimes a lot of programs look at that eight week, two month kind of range um, as an important point in time. But yeah, I think it's it's an interesting, um, yeah, I guess dimension or reality that, that needs to be looked into more. But yeah, we can, we can hop to the next slide, I guess. Um, yeah, just to give a little more context here, um, I just wanted to, um, show really quick the overall life itself kind of research aims. And I think most people here are familiar with what life itself is doing, but we have two main work streams, one of them being the second Renaissance movement, the other being deliberately developmental spaces. Um, and they're not really, um, separate from one another. Um, I think or you know, deliberately developmental spaces are part of this movement or are part of this, I guess, just this general space that Limacon is really involved with. Um, but these are the two ways that we have decided to organize our work or our research. Um, so you know, we'll be focusing on deliberately developmental spaces today, which which is really concerned with how do we make or, or how do we further support 
um, facilitate or even make um, places that can, uh, yeah, foster ontological growth? And and how does that lead to, to systems change? Um, or, yeah, I guess systems change. And how do these two connect? So that's kind of a constant conversation. That's an important conversation to keep having, how deliberately developmental spaces or inner growth, places that um, foster inner growth, how does that uh, connect to the second Renaissance movement? That's kind of a way to think about these um, spaces. Next slide. Um, and to give a bit of a timeline or overview of where this project came from or or what's what's been happening. Um, the conversation started in 2021, long before I was in life itself. Um, but I guess, yeah, they can be understood uh, more broadly as part of a wider effort to what we were, what we used to be, what we, what life itself used to call an awakening society, but we're now kind of going towards a second renaissance framing so part of the wider effort towards a second renaissance movement um the partners that we had for this project were fetzer Escaret, and commonweal um but weren't necessarily the only people working on this kind of project or this space um there's a researcher in the u.s Anne bellamy who has a lot of insightful research uh in this area but she mostly focuses focuses on um gap year programs in the US. Um, so that kind of more so youth development um, and we're kind of broadening uh, our site a little bit to try and include more like adult development as well and, and development more generally. Um, but she was really focusing on yeah gap year programs in the US and she, she's been an amazing help um, throughout this process. And in 23, we really did most research. And by the end of 23, we started to gather a lot of people and organizations um, together to build a field for DDS. So I'll talk about that a little more later. But the idea is really to kind of build field for deliberately developmental spaces. Um, and in 2024, we want to make a more coherent network and um, yeah, help build this field. Um, just to give a little bit of the a sense for the inspirations and some of the language that we use, uh, we really started off thinking about development in, in more Keegan terms, um, but also Jeffrey Martin was really an inspiration, this idea that there's many different ways to develop or many different models that are useful in different contexts. Um, we prefer to use, or we tend to use the, the language of maps and rafts. So maps being overall kind of um, the theoretical foundation or basis and rafts being more of the practice and domains being a, a, a particular thing. Um, and in the beginning, we did have more of a focus on youth development, um, but now we're kind of broadening a little more to include, um, yeah, I guess development more broadly. Um, George Kelly, also been a really big inspiration. Um, SEL, IFS, the creative community model. So th these are just kind of some of the some of the things that were in the back of our mind for um, starting this project and what we've talked about throughout the project. Uh, SEL is social emotional learning. Um, for more like the fundamental questions that we were concerned with. Um, this is just a bit of a list here for also what was in our mind um, throughout this project. Uh, what is human development and how does it happen? Can there be a scale of development? This is something we keep going back to actually. Um, and I can also include some, some of the discussion forms we've had as well, actually to contextualize this a little more if anyone's interested. Um, how does inner ontological development lead to systems transformation? Um, what capacities, individual or collective, are most required for systems transformation? And how can a DDS help to cultivate those? Um, how exactly does mentorship or shared power or elders play a role in human development? 
and from the lot of from a lot of the organizations and we and people that we talk to, it seems to be quite a significant role. Um, so far, at least from our from you know who we've talked to. Um, and to what degree does human development depend on place? Uh, and some of the more practical questions that we're concerned with, um, what kind of programs are out there, uh, what kind of models of development exist out there, and what, what are being used, um, how much time does a program require for meaningful ontological development or transformation, um, how can these spaces be further supported, how might these different places be categorized different into different kinds of DDSs, um, now the language we use for that is is kind of what's the organizational form for a DDS, um, and how can a, f a field be built for deliberately developmental spaces, and what does that field look like? Um, yeah. So, and the way we've we've come to think about that, and I think that's really the 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 overarching goal with this research. And building this um, network of of trying to build a field for DDS, and then we've come to think about it is that there's a, a certain center of the field, um, and kind of the field grows from that center, and that center can include um, some of the language, <laughs> uh, some of the language models, um, and yeah, if uh, James, if you were saying. Uh, if that comment was in regards to you hope there's not a center, was that uh... oh, okay? It was, it was something else. Okay, okay. It was in relation um, to Martin's comment mm -hmm. that was, is there a definition of done for meaningful? Ah, I see, I see, I see, I see. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think the center is kind of just the the momentum or the energy that's the network that's been building around it. Um, so it's not really defined by the boundary but the boundary can kind of give a better sense for where the center is. And by boundary, we mean a lot of like examples that are, is this a DDS? Is this not a DDS? Uh, what's their, how do they understand development? Um, so by looking at different uh, places on the boundary, um, we kind of get a better sense for what is the center and, and how can the center start, start to build more. Um, so, so far, the center of the field um, is really this evolving network of people and organizations that want to, that either currently run or want to further support DDSs. Um, and we have a few outputs from our research so far. One of the things which we'll share with you guys is a manifesto that we've made, a report that we have, and a database with all the organizations that we have. Um, and we've come to think of the different organizations in terms of that center and that periphery. So some organizations are closer to the center, some are closer to the periphery. And I discussed the manifesto already, so we can hop to the next slide. And we can put the link in the chat in a minute when mm -hmm. the stops sharing our drop in. Um, yeah, so I guess I, we use the, the term ecosystem here, but ecosystem or field, um, some recent conversations we've had, we think the field will really be composed of three parts, one of them being research, one of them being exchange, the other being action. Um, and life itself is more concerned with the research kind of, uh, section, um, but the action and exchange are both more concerned with how do we actually build and support DDSs? Um, how do we operationalize some of the language for DDSs? How can more people get involved in DDSs? And, and how can it kind of become a wider phenomenon more, more generally in the, in the world, I guess? Um, and I can talk more about these different sections if anyone's interested, but that's a broad overview. Um, so some of the next steps uh, are, yeah, really launching and building the network. Um, 
getting a sense for the language and the center of the field. Um, people who are really uh, working in this area and uniting or bringing them together. Um, also getting evidence of impact. So getting more, I guess, scientific evidence or, yeah, getting more evidence of impact so that it can be more, um, that more people will be open to support them. And generally speaking, just developing the ecosystem for, for DDSs. So I think that's it for now. Um, and I can pass it back to you, Lauren. Awesome. Thank you. So I'm going to... Um talk about conscious collectives. Um, I won't take up too long on this. So we've we termed it, or for this presentation, this discussion, we've termed it conscious collectives. Many of you will be familiar with us using the term conscious co-living, potentially a bit more frequently. And I feel that we actually are gonna shift over to conscious collectives because it embodies many of the aspects that are actually apparent and useful for this this terminology and this sense of interacting so it, it combines community co-living and also like wider groups so as an example you know workplaces or even sort of places where you go and collect meet as a collective for a hobby or something these can also be be under this conscious collectives um, umbrella so to speak and ultimately uh they well for collectors, we, we've put them together, conscious collectors, because for collectives to work well, they they benefit from, from consciousness, from inner development, from personal development. And then for consciousness to be invested in, developed, accessed, uh, played around with more, or to, to a deeper level, it benefits from actually doing that work in a collective space in, in you know, within an interaction in some sense with another another individual or another individuals. And so the reason that conscious collectives are important and they formulate part of, of something that we're focusing on at life itself is because they give us the access to these like real time moments. You know, things happen out of our control. There are many beautiful happenings. There are also many triggers. And this gives us such an such an array of elements to work with that can really allow us to like deepen our personal and collective work together. So it's kind of where like true transformation can happen in real time. It also has like three um, three aspects that, that we can think of. So one is that it has sustained engagement so that it's not so like hit and run as retreat can often, can often be, as useful as retreats can be. There's often is that element of like, intensive, immersive, and then I'm back out again. And this has much more of a sustainable aspect to it. And feeding into that, there's the support and the connection that is continually available and that can allow for, for the greater fulfillment of our own needs and wants, but also in that offering and supporting and allowing that to, to really support and help and serve another individual or others. So there's this sense of co-creation and, and connection there. And then also we can live more lightly, more mindfully and things like more sustainably or econo economizing our resources, which is also another reason that, that, that we're really, that we feel these are very important. So in essence, they provide the practical and the, psych and the psychosocial need um, within, within them. And so how do we do conscious collectives? So in essence every opportunity or every collective group has has that seed of opportunity within it but there is that sense that there needs to be that buy-in there needs to be that awareness and that sense of openness from the individuals within the group to actually access the, the conscious part the inner development and and to contribute towards that so as i mentioned before you know life itself as like a work organization would be a conscious collective. The hub, the space where people can go and co-live is a conscious co-living, but it's also an embodiment of the conscious collective space. Um, so the key is really is this sense of like turning turning inwards to, to go outwards within these collective spaces. So that kind of like infinity loop that um, Yuli flagged up to us in the beginning. And so what we've done recently is we have set up a new website, which I'll put the link in the chat again in a minute. I'll do a, a hit 
on all the links. And this is currently on consciouskliving.org. And we pulled everything together from our resources into, into one website external from our Life Itself website, because we understand that working with these principles, implementing them, and just really like engaging in this work is hard. It, it's, it's a hard thing to be part of a conscious collective because it's really confronting and it can feel tiring. And the opposite of that is it's also really beautiful. And even that in itself can be quite hard and, and have a lot of energy behind it. So we created a separate website for it so that we could just put all of our resources together, which are like pod, we have got a couple of podcast episodes, some YouTube videos. We've got some like a breakdown more of like the definitions and, and the reasons. And then we've also got these three courses that we have created, which we've pulled through to help support people at any point on their journey. So we have the original one, which is Conscious Co-Living 101. And this is kind of the starting point um, for everyone, but especially for those that maybe are a bit like, uh, I'm not quite sure how to orient myself with this idea. And in essence, it sets the foundation. It sets the, the, the basic knowledge on it, but it's also, it's deeper than basic. It's, it's not something that is going to be painful if you're quite familiar with it. It should hopefully either reinforce the knowledge or give you a little bit of access into, into other areas. Then we have the Transforming Conflict and Community, which we wrote because, or I say we wrote, I wrote because it was very much a, um, a need. Conflict is, there's a lot, of, there a lot of friction can arise in these conscious collectives. And when the friction is there that can obviously result in conflict and actually conflict is a really 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 beautiful place for so much development when it's accessed and understood in a way that allows it to be transformative as opposed to destructive and so this really covers a lot of 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 all the things to do with conflicts conflict styles conflict processes uh, ways to feel more confident and understanding of, of how that can show up as well in different ways within within community and then our last offering which will be sort of officially released in terms of the emails will actually start going out this week um, at the moment it's a pre sign up is our conscious co-living in action practical steps to getting started and this one is this one has a lot of information and we cover three perspectives basically individuals who are looking to join a, a conscious co-living space individuals who want to learn how to transform their current space into something which could be defined as um, a conscious co-living space. And then those that are interested in setting up um, a community or, or a co-living space. And we really dive into to those in the latter half of the course. But first of all, we set you up with the, the inquiry around the, the questions, the understanding, the concepts, the, the sort of deep dive into your kind of why and your expectations to really help support the actual taking it through in, into practical action. So I am now going to open up again into another um, another discussion that we can just do as, as, a, as a big group. And the question that we are, I'll put it in the chat, the question that I would like to open out to everyone to talk about is, do you think you have ever been in a deliberately developmental space? Um, and if so, what was it like? Um, and what did that mean for your development specifically? And if not, maybe you could think about whether it would have benefited you from if being in one would have benefited you or not. So I will stop sharing and we can open that out. Feel free to unmute yourself and just jump in. Um, I'm going to share something that's kind of in the background, not a direct answer, but it occurs to me that in the background, there actually is um, a, a deliberate holding of culture that's happening in our regular day-to-day -day lives, even outside of de deliberately developmental spaces or communities. Like there's a larger space container in our economics, our politics, our media. And so it's, it, I'm just finding it really interesting to notice like, what's my development like there? And then what's my development like in the 
uh, smaller, more deliberate kind of like you're with the people you're actively co-creating and holding the deliberation, yeah. holding the, the, the deliberateness of the development of container. And um, have you have you noticed from that inquiry, let's just come, maybe just come up for you now, have you noticed something that you can share around how it how how you show up differently? Yeah, I think I think there's a there's a real um one of the biggest differences that I notice is in in the regular kind of let's say work life or school context, um the way that I make contact with other people's aliveness is a lot more surface level. It's not deeply relational. And I end up then like transforming myself based on what happens to be alive, but in a way that's kind of pragmatically grounded in my life as a solo player. Like as I have this next care about that I'm going to move on to, how did my last week's conversation in whatever context I was in affect me? And so it actually it actually misses some core components. It it's less um, co-evolving. It's less relational. It's less intimate. Not that there aren't lots of uh, deep intimate connections, but as a whole, um, where the deliberately developmental spaces I've been in um, actually focus on making sure to bring the intimate human connection as a conscious and consistent part of what it means to learn and orient me to more than what's pragmatically salient for my life, but as well what's pragmatically salient for other people in my community or in that space. So those are probably the two biggest differences. Awesome, thank you. Thank you. Matthew? Yeah, I just, I just, I guess I wanted to add on to your comment there, Yuli, which I also, uh, find that happening in my own life as well and it's it's kind of like a funny situation right where it's like here's my development uh here's my development in a space which for me feels like it's a real kind of humane development which also helps other people on on this end and then there's here's my development as a person um or as like an agent in school or in this economic system and ideally, they wouldn't be separate. Like, ideally, they would be the same thing. Um, but they aren't. Um, so it's it's something, I guess, um, I kind of uh, have to hold a lot as, as somebody that's kind of, uh, you know, in school and, you know, um, having to find a job and these things. But it's like, sometimes my development in one place is not the same as the other and ideally like you would have a culture or have a yeah a broader set of social systems which support human development and people think it's like a radical idea or people might think it's a radical idea like a dds but or having human development as a, a central part in in broader social systems but it, it really shouldn't be a radical idea it should that's the way in my opinion like it should be um, you shouldn't have this development and that development. They should be um, the same. Any other thoughts being triggered that people want to jump in? Yeah, go for it, Daniel. Um, <clears throat> so thanks to Yuli's prompt, I'm kind of looking now at the differences that that kind of firm that up for me. And I, I feel like my experience in kind of this liminal web space has been very deliberately developmental. I don't know if that's the whole space or just the people who I have interacted with in the time in my time here. And then also within Limicon, the team tried to make our working space that way as well. Um, and so when I look at the differences, what I feel like is I've been receiving a lot of permission and yeses instead of like in other jobs, like no's, like, oh, that's that's wrong. Like mistakes are welcome. And it's just about what you do after the mistake, not about like the mistake. Um, and then the other thing, whoa, I, I didn't expect to get emotional in this session, <laughs> that, um, that feels good in this space is there's no end. Like, I feel like 
I join a new space out in the, in the non deliberately developed and it's like, oh, there's stuff to learn for a minute, but then there's always like this. Now you're done. <laughs> and then what is it where it feels like in this space? Um, every question leads to the next question. And so it's you can go forever. And like that to me is curiosity is I, my dissertation was on curiosity. So <laughs> like that is something that I, I'm really attached to. And um, I just feel it as part of something in the human spirit. And um, I think that's what makes us old and like stopping learning and stuff. You know what I mean? Just being like, okay, I'm going to do this same puzzle for the rest of my life. Like that, I think that has an effect on people. And I, I think that continued growth is important. So thanks. Yeah, it's really beautiful. Thank you. Um, this actually triggered something that I really love to sort of also open up what Danielle said is what characteristics do you feel are really important? The one that, that Danielle sort of offered us up was curiosity. Like what what feels alive for you in in a characteristic that is would be useful is useful to to be aware of to have to to really be able to access these de these deliberately developmental spaces serious play I was thinking of playfulness yeah yeah I'm more than happy as well for people to like extend on this because I I feel like we can often just you know sort of say a characteristic and we don't necessarily always like dive in as much and it can like, kind of open us up into a different into a different place so that the space hinges on the receiver of the developmental growth so the space needs to either filter for those people or help them develop the attitude awareness of awareness <laughs> can we ever have too much awareness do you think it can sometimes be a problem there's a term navel gazing that might point at that. Any other any other thoughts? Things people want to throw in. And this it, can also go. Oh, sorry, go. I was gonna say this is a, a stab at a term. I'm kind of like feeling into the earlier conversations here. Um, something like integrative differentiation. Like in, you were just saying, like, is there too much awareness? And I'm thinking, yeah, there's times where like it makes a lot more sense to very clearly focus on one part. And that's a differentiation. It's actually saying kind of for the moment, no to that kind of awareness. Yes to this kind of awareness. But it's like it's integrative because it plays a part in the larger whole. Mm. Yeah, something like that. Okay. Okay. Oh, I'll also say, actually, there was a tagline from one of the communities I was in that was really powerful. Doing differences differently. Doing differences yeah that's like a bit that's like a very constant and powerful theme in a lot of my shared networks and deliberately developmental spaces that i really love thank you so we have care polarity management would you like to speak more on on care Anne? yeah i think that for me like canine care for each other would be an aspect that i would define as crucial to a deliberately developmental space and then I'm also noticing like mm, I'm not fully sure if it, is it like crucial or not um, I think maybe I see like two kinds of deliberately developmental spaces I've been in and one kind would be um, spaces where people really invest in building relationships and come together over a long period of time or like one example of that yeah, would be like a residency in life itself a one month uh, residency i um, helped in the facilitation of one in 2022 um, or like pods people meeting like once a week for two hours or an hour and a half and do that for a long time period and then you get to know each other on a deeper level and that like automatically sparks care. And then I notice like another kind of deliberately developmental spaces I have been in and those are more like practice focused, but then you do some practice with someone you don't really know and will maybe never see again. And then there's also growth and development, but it's somehow different for me so yeah pondering about the difference and 
yes, some are more obviously the shortest. Yeah, it, it brings growth as well, but maybe it's more on the outside of the field that you depict it. I'm not sure. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else like to throw anything into the space? Let's see what's in the chat. Any other thoughts? I guess I'll just say um, you brought up a uh, psychological safety is the number one trait of high performance teams, James. Um, um, but I guess I'm curious what you mean like corporate speak translates care relating to. Um, could you just uh, clarify that real quick? Yeah, yeah, and I I put it in quotes. You know, it's slightly mm -hmm. ironically not one hundred percent endorsing the corporate mm -hmm. speak version of it, but mm -hmm. just the same care uh, and relationality that Anne was pointing at and pointing to. Uh, I think even in the most you know modernist, rationalist, um, you know, corporate um, kind of research and analysis, I think that they're finding the the same thing and trying mm -hmm. to notice the same thing that oh yeah uh the amount the degree to which you know team members care about each other and create a space where it's okay to make mistakes uh and you know have that relational fabric uh they're finding like oh yeah that actually is key to high performance whatever you define performance as in the you know corporate context mm. Mm. yeah um that's interesting. It's kind of interesting how it, it does lead to to higher performance. Um, as like a a way a human should be kind of being activated in that sense. Um, in with a lot of the people that we talked to, um, they had mentioned safety as like a the a really important quality of a space. Um, but it's kind of interesting for me because it's like a particular kind of safety in my experience. And I don't really know how to, um, it's hard to put into words, like what it means to be, what it means to feel safe in a particular space. And I often hear the term safe space and it's like, that's, that doesn't really, um, I don't know. It's, it's, it's very difficult to, to try and capture what it means, but, um, I think safety definitely is, um, yeah, re related to care. And it's, it's, a it's hard to put one's finger on what, what exactly it is. I find it interesting that we've also taken like um, a step into speaking kind of about like jobs, workplaces, corporations, organizations in, in, in that sense. Like that that feels like it flags up to me that that maybe is an area that is lacking in in accessing this kind of work as, as widely. And it is maybe this question of how we pull this through into organizations that are maybe not as as um grounded in the kind of work want that that we seem to be engaged in, in in this space because we're very fortunate in this space that we can have these conversations and in theory the some of the organizations that we are linked to and involved in and they're also going to be individuals that are using this space to to counter the offset of their other spaces that are maybe less deliberately developmental and yeah, I find that kind of like, that also very interesting and, and interweaving. Hi, Victor, you have something to say, go for it. Hey there, Lauren. Yeah. Um, so I think the question is about like, have we been in deliberately the developmental spaces and what are some of the qualities of it? Um, in my mind, like a space is like a relational field, right? which could indeed be like an organization, but could be like just a one-on-one -on -one relationship. So like I found myself reflecting on like the ways in which the relationship with the love of my life is like deliberately developmental of intimacy and the kind of things that, uh, that, that came up were like, you know, between the two of us, like there's a commitment to to truth and, and curiosity, uh, 
like and an important part of that like is about surfacing the kind of personal stories that that like come up right um which oftentimes can be like identified with or made like sort of my truth or something like that but if held a bit more loosely and seem something that has truth but also like not truth and to feel like for there to be sort of like a spirit of trust and openness that allows for us to look at those stories to discover like what the truth is and like what uh, what might not be true right to accept that like uh that that's the case right leads to uh to discovery like of what's going on inside and oftentimes like you know a, a dissolution of something development can mean like you know a uh, a removal of of some of like something that that uh, that isn't true right or an appreciation of something that isn't true. and like a learning from that so yeah i think those are some qualities that i think are really important uh, in deliberately developmental spaces mm. yeah thank you so much for sharing mm. really resonated yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah that was great and i guess i i, I could just to add on that real quick um the big challenge is like how can you do that as a group or like how can a space um continually cultivate that commitment to truthness i guess um um yeah i guess that's one of the main questions that's that's being investigated in these in these places so i thought i'd open up like weaving this into maybe a slightly different question is I'm going to post it in the chat instead of resharing my screen. So to inquire into at what point a conscious collective might become a deliberately developmental space or, you know, or stop. So maybe it's a deliberately developmental space. When do, where does that stop? Like where does, how does that land with people based on what we've, the diagram Matthew sort of showed earlier as a, a sort of very simple way of trying to to identify that. So what point does it tip from a conscious collective into a develop, deliberately developmental space? Or is is that is it always interwoven where what do people feel? Oh I just I just re emojied the emoji you just did James. It wasn't my intention but <laughs> That, that brings me back to the uh, awareness of awareness characteristic. And yeah, I guess maybe it'll just point to that word conscious too. Of uh, As long as you have kind of the conscious awareness of yourself and what you're doing deliberately, intentionally, then you've got that outer frame that can handle anything and keep going. But if you kind of lose that outer layer of consciousness, awareness of what you're doing, well, then like then you're just in a rut. You're just doing what you're doing without that, you know, holding of the process as an object so that you can continue learning. Mm -hmm. Uh, But yeah, just that's the characteristic, essential quality of getting stuck is losing that awareness that there are other ways and other things and you just do what you do because you do it mm-hmm. like madness is doing the same thing and expecting different results kind of kind of vibe mm. unconsciousness is doing the same thing over and over because you forget that there are other options <laughs> thank you anyone else have any other thoughts or even like unknowns, like I feel like sometimes discussing, like actually I don't know about this, can really open up a space to sort of inquire more and ask different questions or 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 delve deeper into into something that's underneath the surface. Um, I notice what comes up for me is I think about a conscious collective. Like they have structure at different levels, I think. Like a de- deliberately developmental space has more, or to my reading or experience with it, has more structure that's at the level of like, what are we doing this week? How are we holding things? What are the kinds of practices? So there's some clarity at an action level that 
that the people in the space can look at and be like, okay, I think the following actions make sense based on these agreed um, agreed aspects of what development we're caring about and how to steward this particular space. Um, so the space is kind of clear. When I think about a conscious collective, it feels almost like the consciousness is like up one level and down one level. It's like the individuals are uh, have a have a container within that are like, I'm going to stay conscious. And the collective has a shared cultural understanding of like, oh, this is a conscious collective. Um, and to me, conscious implies kind of like very adaptive. Where a deliberately developmental seems to, in my experience, at least have a lot more structure to it and doesn't feel quite as adaptive. So I'm kind of feeling like, oh, so there's like three levels at which you could have um, a certain amount of structure. And I feel like collective consciousness has that structure at the individual level for sure. And at the cultural level, um, the deliberately developmental spaces have more structure at the kind of like action or group or space definition level some, somewhere in between on the on the ladder of abstraction. Awesome, thank you. Anyone else? I can see a lot of thinking faces. I'd love to know what's going on behind them. I guess for me, um, I kind of wish I heard your point a little more, Yuli, because I was reflecting a bit on uh, what James had said. Um, conscious is doing the same thing because you don't know there are other options. Um, and I think that for many people, um, and I'm not necessarily saying this in a negative way at all about them, but they, re they don't know um, that there are other possibilities, I guess, or other ways of living. And I think that's that's the uh, one of the primary goals with uh, DDS and conscious co-living, to try and make um, other options more palatable or people, or have people be more aware of these, these other options. Um, so I, I really, um, yeah, I really resonated with what you said, James, about uh, unconscious doing the same thing not knowing that, that there are other options yeah i think that's like that point you just mentioned matthew is is something we spoke about when we were setting up the conscious co-living website and we were actually like which where is that entry point is it from consciousness or is it from the co-living like if we want to get this out a bit more to individuals how how can we do that because we know that our community has a real love want need focus drive around consciousness but does that translate if we want to go a little step further out to 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 kind of get this sense to be a bit more integrated into into wider society how how can we go in and for us the discussion came to the point that actually co-living was the best sort of entry point to start with um, as a way to, to draw people in to then be able to say hey you can live differently you can have a different type of collective a different way of showing up but it does come with this and if you really want to have that change if you actually want to stop doing the same things and creating the same insufficient results or problems you, you do need to bring this through and forward um, so that was, I think there was that slight nuance that actually took up quite a large space about our conversation, which was super useful when we were figuring out how to frame it, that you we could go in from actually the consciousness in the development perspective, but maybe the, the co-living felt like a, a gentler entry point to then bring the, the consciousness and the inner development aspect through to individuals. I'm going to just open the space up for any questions now, any thoughts or anything that people want to share that's kind of just come up in the in the space um, throughout the last sort of hour and a bit. I think Martin has asked a question. 
um, based on our earlier discussion, can you have development without embodying the required capacities? I'd love to hear people's perspectives on that. I'd love to hear the question expanded. From me or from Martin? From Martin, I guess, because it's his question. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, exactly. And so basically, there's all this kind of talk, how are we going to scale up uh, this and what kind of environment? And there is this kind of ne neglection of the capacities of the cohort of people that might need to have in order for that to happen. And also this definition of the deliberate developmental space, as it started kind of in my mind from radiating outside from, from the source of of the doctrine of, of development, but it's actually the interaction and the dynamics between the receivers, which means the individuals who are graced with motivation and the attitude and certain capacities in order to receive this knowledge and the source which gives the knowledge. Um, so in my mind, you can't scale it up um, if you ignore that you need the quality on the receiving end as well as, a, as, as, as as the quality in the design, intelligence in the design of the DDS and the message that you are projecting. So that's kind of what I'm thinking about. I feel like one aspect of, of, of what you're what you're speaking about, Martin, is that part of the of the deliberately developmental spaces is the development of some of these capacities, like allowing people to understand how to access that within themselves. And obviously, again, the framing, the space, the the entry point of of the kind of like requirements is is going to differ. But in theory, there will be these like earlier deliberately developmental spaces that are really going to be able to facilitate helping individuals to cultivate the required capacities in that sense to be able to move forward into like a deeper inquiry. And I think that's really key is understanding the kind of re entry level of some of these spaces and also maybe even playing around in some of these spaces, the fact that, okay, there's going to be varying points. And that's also part of the exploration. And sometimes we learn from seeing people that are, really, uh, you know, are further ahead of us on the journey and other times we learn actually really well as a collective when we're all kind of in the mud and the struggle together and then there's often this dance um around that danielle you have a muted what you'd like to share i'm getting a little stuck on the question because it i feel like and this could just be my worldview that's not correct <laughs> but i feel like we all embody the capacities like and they get stifled by the environment. You know what I mean? Like, I wonder if it's, and I think that would be important because then it would matter like how you interact with somebody. It wouldn't be like, okay, there's these capacities we need to develop in everybody, but there's these people who've been traumatized or whatever word you want to put on it. So they've kind of dulled those capacities. And then there's people who, you know, are more in their capacities. I just think about kids and they're going to learn. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's a really a really beautiful point. Thank you for clarifying that we all have those capacities within us, but sometimes they're blocked, stifled. We we maybe haven't utilized them as much. So it's like a muscle, it's not as strong. Um so yeah, no, thank you for thank you for offering that. Um I'm mindful we have like 15 minutes left. Um there's no rush, but I kind of get a sense that we might be coming more to a close. Rupert. Hi, welcome. What would you like to share? Well, so in the background, I don't know. I, I obviously I've come family life to the, towards the end of this talk, so I don't know what's got covered yet. Before. But the really big question, well, one of the big questions for me around deliberately developed space and conscious collectives was to say, okay, um, two parts. So one is that through much of history spaces that were i would call deliberately eventual were like monasteries uh or part of a religious spiritual order in which um yeah people were kind of set apart from like ordinary life in a variety of ways like so classic monastic precepts 
let's say put as you know you're not going to have kids there's no, there's no sex you're going to give away all your possessions you're not really going to earn a living you're going to live by by begging if you are or, you know or basically by donations um so kind of roughly for most of that time if you are really see kind of really engaging in inner development in a way and certainly in waking up practices you didn't take part in kind of quote unquote normal life and i guess i'm not i've thought about being a monk i decided well i didn't think that seriously but you know one of my very good friends became a monk um uh, If I don't want to kind of be like, oh, I, 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 I was guess one of my questions is what is the possibilities of lay awakening? You know, uh, what I mean is that waking up or engaging in um, significant like inner development or multi or multi dimensional praxis ontological development, where you you know in more conventional people earning a living, they may have kids, they engage in more mainstream society in a variety of ways. I think that this possibility is relatively novel in human history for a couple of reasons. As I said, it's not, I don't think it's just an accident that hasn't happened in, in, in history. And not to say there aren't lay people, there are people in Buddhist stories, obviously Christian, there are many people who have advanced on the path, but more systematically, it hasn't. One is that the level of abundance, at least in certain countries now in, in the world, mean that there's a degree of leisure that's possible for people who are, are lay practitioners, you know, lay practitioners, you might say. And the second, I think, is in our advances uh, or maybe access to both wisdom traditions, but I would also say empirical scientific traditions that have advanced our understanding or development, I think, of certain pra of practices, you know, uh, um, awakening practices and, and, and also kind of, I would say, cleaning up practices like psychotherapeutic work. So what, why I'm saying all of that kind of background, say like this is an interesting and novel moment in in the history of human civilization in that it's suddenly possible for a much larger set of people because traditionally it's like you were going to become a monk and even among the many monks just go to have you know to have a reasonable life but you know it was a really really small minority who were going to go do those things suddenly it's like much more possible for a much broader set of people to engage in this now but there are certain things that we take from you know, there's reason monastic structures have the structure they do most of them most of them not all of them are community-based obviously there's the hermit model um but most of them at least the beginning on your path you're in the community and so, it, so it seems so to come back to this dds community you know conscious collectives whether it has to be a physical community it could now be also online but there seems to be communities important to this kind of level of development um or to engaging in development in this intensive way but there's this kind of new opportunity for that so that's one thing which is that i feel D dds is kind of saying they're not really novel they've been you know we've had forms of them for many but there's something kind of novel now that's possible No, so that's one on the that's the kind of supply side that's the opportunity side right and on the demand side there is that basically it my contention at least would be that all of the discussions we have about new paradigms and uh deliberate you know and teal you know or awakening societies or you know meta modern societies whatever you name require really significant um kind of somehow shift like you know in terms of personal and collective development and particularly i would say collective development you know just as my joke goes i go around and ask people have they actually met any teal organizations actually any, actually met any teal intentional communities whatever and like the answer comes back that very silent it's very rare in fact i, I don't think i've got one where someone has conv convincingly said that and i don't think that's a critique i think these things are quite are quite hard but i'm just saying to the on the demand side this i would contend that this kind of that these spaces and or these collectives and it could be in work it could be work organizations it could be living situation it could be a combination of both are also you know these this setup is i think behind what will allow us to create experiments at the level we want you know it, um, because i think this is just way There's something hard about this there's something to be something really hard about groups operating together and i mean you can point out some really obvious hard problems one is how do you which which often seem contradictions today which is like for example between individualism and the group one of the things we can really imagine in new kind of collectives is they somehow can retain a very high level of what might, might feel like is autonomy 
or capacity for diversity of views somehow, or at least of certain kind of views and, and, and actions, while also being able to move as one, you know, move as a river is that one little phrase, at least I know from Buddhism comes as, you know, how do we, you know, the, the, the phrase goes, you know, if you go as a drop, if you go as a single drop from the mountains to the sea, you will evaporate. As you go as a river, you will arrive at the sea. So there's this kind of real aspect. That's one really hard nut, right? And, you know, there's some very interesting work in some emerging practices around we space and other stuff about that. But how does that happen? Um, you know, how do we practically on governance levels go where we don't go for the tyranny of like democracy or tyranny of the dictator, but we also don't just become horizontalism, you know, et cetera. There's these really tough problems um, about collective action, about or collective organization, about individualism versus the group that we can imagine somehow transcending with the right kind of, um, the, the right or sufficient, I don't want to say the right, but the sufficient level of inner, of personal and collective development. So just to finish, we've got this demand opportunity, which is which is calling for conscious collectives and I think uh, deliberate generative space so there's opportunity for them because people basically need us just go back to you need a certain amount of time a day I I don't think you can really do deliberately rental spaces without like probably one or close to one or two hours of practice a day maybe on average mix between personal and collective practice and if you could eventually work an eight to ten hour job or something like that it's just not there it's just not sufficient energy for it so there's this opportunity and then there's demand there's this need in the meta crisis which is the manifesto in developmental spaces.org and so on. So that's just only conclude. I think what, um, you know, to, to answer the question, I don't think strictly what we mean by conscious collectives are, they are deliberately mental spaces. I think we often you at least life itself, we're using the term conscious co-living and conscious collectives as a, there might be a spectrum of them. We're allowing that there might be a bit of a spectrum that allows this kind of more in, easy way in. But like, I think a full conscious co-living environment is a deliberate environmental space in the, in the strong sense of it is that one where, where a major purpose of it exists, not the only, but a major purpose is to foster and support in a personal and collective development. Um, I have a follow-up riff if there's space in the room. Um, I just want to name kind of some stuff that came up while you were speaking, Rufus, which I really appreciate it. Um, I, and Lauren mentioned this earlier, there's a sort of like, how do you integrate and practice the stuff that you get from a community? Like what happens when you're at home washing the dishes? Uh, what happens when you're in the kitchen? Um, so there's there's just something that's come up over a couple of sessions now. I've been to this is my third life itself presentation and discussion session. And there is a theme that feels like I'm I keep coming back to about something about like it, it's not a fully well formed thought, but it comes out as like there are these cutting edge spaces that are able to develop the theory and have like a cut, you know, like you were saying, Rufus, right at the end, this kind of like high class, well understood, deeply practiced, high capacity, deliberately developmental space. And then there's a bunch of people on the planet who don't have the luxury to be able to take those ideas in and work with them. And so they're they're doing things in a very different way. But like Lauren was saying earlier, there's or actually I don't know who said this part, but um there's a there's an there is an intrinsic capacity that we all have as children to be learning. And there is an intrinsic capacity for transformation and relationship in all of us. And there's something about something I'm sitting with that I, it's not coming out perfectly, but there's something about like a multi-pronged approach of there being a practice of being in the kitchen and making soup with people and that having a deliberately developmental component that doesn't have the same language, but there, but, but it still has some language. And then there's people who are at the cutting edge of developing the ideas of how do you form the Venn diagram intersection. And it's like, um, how do you take those ideas and put them in a children's book? That's the kind of crux of my question. How do you find the different ways of expressing those same values and, and same emergent potential that is already intrinsic and we're seeing emerge? How do you phrase that and communicate it in 
uh, across different contexts as well as across different developmental capacities. So yeah, I kind of want to see what this looks like in a children book, children's book. I want to see what it looks like on Facebook, and I want to see what it looks like at the cutting edge academic discussion. There's something valuable in that for me. Is there anything else present for anyone that they'd like to share? Okay, I'm gonna invite us all just to take a breath together as a way to close the space and uh, thank you all. So if we all just take a big inhalation now and exhale through the mouth. Thank you all for your time and energy and showing up today and bringing your insights, your questions and your presence. It is always appreciated. Um, if you would like to keep in touch with us, we have two uh, WhatsApp channels, which are probably the easiest way. One is a new, as Matthew, I think, was telling me, deliberately developmental spaces WhatsApp chat. So I'm going to get him to drop that into the chat for you all. And I'm going to share the life itself uh, WhatsApp chat, which I think most of you are in already but you can always pass it on to friends if not so there's the link again for for the general chat and do you have the dds one there Matthew, or do you need me to do it to be clear the yeah, dds is, is more for people who want to really specifically be involved mm -hmm. not to put me off but like if you really mm -hmm. want to be involved in a kind of network about maybe feel, building the field for the liberty mental space it's like mm -hmm. kind of about let if you're more interested in day-to-day Conscious collectives, conscious co-living. I would go in the 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 life itself, conscious co-living yeah. chat. Um, that's a good point. Thank as, you. As one of the co-organizers of both of those space sets. Um, oh, if you actually wanted to build a DDS, uh, and you're you know or whatever, and you actually want to design or you want to raise funds, then the other one might be relevant. Um, just want to say, just to say for my part, first of all, thank you for everyone who's come to this thing. Uh, I'm by the way, I'm Rufus. You arrived a bit late, but I'm one of co-founders of life itself and a colleague of Lauren and Matthew. But I just want to say a massive thank you for people's presence here. And also a massive thank you to all the different people. I know it's been kind of, uh, it's a self-organizing event, Limicon, but um, yeah, real appreciation to the various people who've kind of create, you know, given time to make it come into being. Uh, I believe, you know, so, some people like Danielle and others on the call. Also Lauren has spent time, but like holding the space for the space, these spaces to happen. So this, I want to say a big thank you for that. Before I go here in Europe, I head 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 to uh, head towards my beauty sleep, especially as time uh, clocks change. So lots of love, everyone. Have a wonderful Saturday, Sunday. See you people soon. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye. See you guys.